I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no growing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no growing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. 579, one of our newer choruses, One More Day. And one day, it will be one more day, won't it? One more day, just imagine. One more day till he comes. One more day to be ready. One more soul to be saved. One more soul for the kingdom. He will not wait when the time has come. One more soul to be gathered. One more day to go. I want his word deeper in my heart. His name already on my lips. He's coming and will not linger one more day. One more day, just imagine. One more day till he comes. One more day to be ready. One more so from the top now. One more day, just imagine. One more day till he comes. One more day to be ready. One more so to be saved. One more soul for the kingdom. He will not wait when the time has come. One more soul to be gathered. One more day to go. I want his word deeper in my heart. Name already on my lips. His coming and will not linger. One more day. One more day. Just imagine one more day till it comes. One more day to be ready. One more soul to be saved. One more day to go. Okay, we're going to have chorus 558, brothers and sisters. We'll get the brothers to collect the tithes during this chorus, please. Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, let's get together and magnify the Lord with one accord. When we're together, praising the Lord now, all the angels in heaven rejoice before the Lord. Harmony. We've been set free Out of the darkness and into the light we came Brothers and sisters, let's get together Let's praise the Lord now Sing hallelujah Let's sing together in his name Let's do it again Brothers and sisters, let's get together and magnify the Lord with one accord. When we're together, praising the Lord now, all the angels in heaven rejoice before the Lord. Harmony. We've been set free 
Out of the darkness and into the light we came. Brothers and sisters, let's get together. Let's praise the Lord now. Sing hallelujah. Let's sing together in his name with one accord. Another one of our new ones. Jesus is the bread of life. Here we go. Jesus is the bread of life. He who come to him shall never hunger, never thirst again. Shackles have been loosened and my heart has been set free. Anchored by the Holy Ghost within. Yes, and some might say you're crazy. Explain away the miracles you see. But Jesus Christ has sent me to let the sinners know they can be free. When we're standing on the word of God, we shall not be moved. Standing with the King of Kings within. Jesus is a bread of life, we come to him, shall never. The shackles have been loosened and my heart's been set free. Anchored by the Holy Ghost within. Yes, and some might say you're crazy. Explain away the miracles you see. But Jesus Christ has sent me to let the sinners know they can be free. When we're standing on the word of God, we shall not be moved. Standing with the King of Kings within. One for one, I love this family of God. We certainly do. After this chorus, we're going to be learning a brand new chorus, which Grant will uh, happily lead. So thank you, Grant. But we'll sing the golden oldie here. I love this family of God. Here we go. I love this family of God. So closely knitted into one. They've taken me into their heart. And I'm so glad to be a part of this great family. So won't you join this happy throng? You'll find it's just where you belong. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The Word of God will be made clear in this great family. Okay, we'll invite Grant up now. Thanks, Grant. All right, some might know this already. 569, it's in the book. It's one from Papua New Guinea. I, be I believe uh, Pastor Tony may have done it for us last time he was over. Um, and we're going to try and do it at leadership camp, but I just we're going to do it for the rest of the month. So after we get back from leadership camp, we'll keep singing it through the month. It's, it's fun. If you don't know it, I'm going to sing it. I'm doing this like an item, all right? Just so that it's in your head. You'll be singing it all week, promise. All right. Clap along with me. These may be the last days of our lives. There may be no tomorrow for us. The signs of the times are painted high up in the sky for the world to know that Jesus is coming soon. How can you be so deaf when you blind when you see there's a never-ending story that Jesus Christ will take us home these may be the last days of our lives there may be no tomorrow for us 
signs of the times are painted high up in the sky for the world to know that Jesus is coming soon. How can you be so deaf when you listen? How can you be so blind when you Christ will take us home. How can you be so deaf when you listen? How can you be so blind when you see? There's a never-ending story that Jesus Christ will take us home. That Jesus Christ will take us home. There you go. Now try and remember the words that you got the tune in your head. Back to Andrew. Well done, Grant. Very good teacher. All right, we're going to be outstanding now for our hymn, which is number 636 or 895 changed. That's uh, a chorus. Chorus, Eli. There we go. And if the prayer sheet could be uh, brought down, that'd be fantastic. A wonderful miracle happened to me. Wonderful miracle set me free. No more confusion, torment inside. God of creation has changed my life. Wonderful. to me a wonderful miracle no more sadness sickness or strife now I may beautiful in my father's eye I called unto God and he rescued me oh what a savior is my God now I trust in him live by faith in him by him I've been changed I've been changed been made to our God. Oh, what a wonderful plan. We have been changed, been made a new man. Glory to our God. Oh, what a wonderful plan. We have been changed Everyone's in a hurry to get to the presentation by the looks of it. Well, we're going to give glory to our God now for uh, working in these people's lives here that have been put up uh, this evening. We might ask Ryan Alexander, if that's all right, Ryan, just to open the meeting here and put these prayer needs towards the Lord. Nicola from Cancer, Christopher needs healing. 
Pauline healing from a heart problem, and Trevor healing of anxiety. So let's just praise the Lord now. Thanks, Ryan. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And all the people said? Take your seats, everybody. Thank you very much, Ryan. Once again, good evening and welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to get straight into the presentation this afternoon. So thank you, Ben. We'll invite David up now. Thanks, David. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, the tech guys, well, they're right on the ball tonight. Supposed to need a little bit of time to get set up, so I prepared some intro, so I'll do it anyway. Um, so if, if you don't know me, my name's David, and I work for, no, I'm employed by the state. Um, a few people got that, not many. Come on. <laughs> So, for the last 20 years, um, I've been involved with the design, installation and maintenance of equipment that monitors the natural water resources of South Australia. Um, the first years of that, I was time doing uh, seismology, which monitors earthquakes. But we're not talking about earthquakes tonight, we're talking about water. Uh, Myself, my particular area of responsibility for water monitoring is in the APY lands of South Australia. Uh, but the look after manages equipment that's scattered all over South Australia. The has been advertised as water from the rock, so that's one of the two stories that we're going to be looking at tonight. But I've called it Old Testament water sources. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to stress that none of what I'm going to present should be viewed as doctrine. That's to say that we don't, it's not critical to our beliefs, all right? In fact, some of what I present is a bit of speculation based on all right? So if you don't agree with it, don't bother coming up to me later, all right? <laughs> because you might be right, all right? Um, so... Let's get on. So, where's this? Oh, it works. Brilliant. All right. So, we're going to look at two stories in the Old Testament tonight. The first one we're going to look at is Moses and water from the rock. A lot of people will be familiar with this story. And the second one we're going to look at is Isaac's wells, which is not quite as well known. So before we look into the actual Bible stories, I want to go into a bit of information about water sources so that we can help appreciate these stories in a bit more context. So, the two basic sources of water for human consumption. Firstly, what we call is surface water, and that is things like lakes, rivers, streams, etc. Occasionally we dam them up to stabilise their availability as water and sometimes we generate electricity from them as well. The photo on the top, that's of Cotter Dam in Canberra, which is one of their major water sources and they also use it for generating electricity. And the other one down the bottom, you might recognise as our mighty Murray River which is um, one of Adelaide's major water sources. Um, so, but that's about it that I'm going to talk about surface water because it's not particularly relevant to the rest of the presentation. So, let's move on to what we call groundwater. It comes from underground. Very technical stuff. Uh, Sometimes groundwater spurts out of the ground under its own pressure. We call that artesian water. 
Um, otherwise, if it doesn't come up by itself, we need pumps to get it out from the ground. So let's have a little bit of a deeper look at groundwater because that relates to our Bible stories. So putting this into local context, so you recognise a couple of maps of Australia there. So the top right map is an image that shows the, the various groundwater sources in Australia. Some of the groundwater comes out relatively easy and other is, is pretty difficult to get out. The different colours in that map try and indicate what's easier to get out and what's not. Um, the other diagram on the left, the, mainly the blue area there, that's the most famous underground water storage in Australia. It's called the Great Artesian Basin. Uh, and a lot of our remote pastoralists rely on that uh, as a water source for themselves and for their stock, and a lot of outback industry also uses that water source. Now, a lot of the GAB, as we call it, Great Artesian Basin, a lot of that water is artesian. And if we look at the diagram on the bottom right as well, it tries to depict how artesian water occurs. So what happens is we get rainfall in the tropics of Queensland in the mountains and that seeps down through the ground and travels underground into the middle of Australia. Because the mountains in Queensland are higher than what the desert is in the middle, the hydraulic pressure of the water forces it up out of the ground. Right, it's just a bit like having a rainwater tank with a hose attached to it. Your tank's higher than the hose, so the water comes out. It's pretty simple. Um, but what's not simple is that that water takes several million years to perform that travel. Right? That's a long time. Uh, doo -doo -doo. What have I forgotten to say? Just Oh, yes. Okay. So the temperature of the water can actually be very, very hot. Um, in some areas of the GAB, the water is up around 98 degrees Celsius. So it's almost boiling coming out of the ground. And some of it's also under extreme pressure. So it's extremely dangerous to actually work on. Um, a lot of the cooler areas of the GAB, sort of around the, the edges of it, the water's more like 35 to 40 degrees. Um, one well-known area for that for outback travellers is called Dalhousie Springs, just up on the southern edge of the Sturt Desert. Um, and that's around 38, 39 degrees in this huge swimming pool that you can go and swim in. So, moving along. Oh, there we go. Some of the natural artesian springs in the GAB are known as mound springs. Uh, the water is forced up from underground, it brings sediments with it. And the sediments are deposited around the hole and over a long period of time, many, many years, the sediments build up to form a mound. And the higher the mound becomes, the slower the flow of water. When we talked earlier about hydraulic pressure, right, so as you raise the end of the garden hose to the same height as the tank, the water stops to flow. So as the mound spring builds up, the water slows down. There's a bit of a map there of um, area South Australia known as the Udnadatta Track. And there's a, a whole string of mound strings along the Udnadatta Track. There's the um, original Gann railway line followed these mound springs because they used them as a source of water for the steam engines. Right, so. Uh, there's a photo there on the, on the left, it's called the Bubbler. Uh, that's a mound spring on the Edna track. Um, and it is just, you stand there and watch it and every now and then some bubbles rise to the surface. It's very, very slow flowing now. On the bottom right is um, another, well, it's not actually a mound spring as such, but it's artesian water that has been turned into a spa. There's a campground there called Coward Springs and the owners 
of the Coward Springs camp have turned it into a spa so that travellers there can pop in and relax. And a few other strange sort of people are attracted to um, Cowan's as well. Um, there's a bit of a story behind this um, photo, um, but just for the sake of time, um, the Hurtados and the Catleys were holidaying quite separately along the Udnadatta track. This was a, quite a few years ago now. Um, neither of us were planning to stay at um, Coward Springs that night, but we met up, or rather they found us, as I recall, um, much to our shock. Um, but we had a really great night of fellowship, um, and it really does show you can't hide. The saints will find you. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of the desert trying to pitch your tent behind you. So, given enough time, with Mound Springs, we're talking about Mound Springs again, not spas, um, the build-up of sediments and the reducing water pressure, those will combine to actually, the water will stop flowing completely and the Mound Spring will cease to flow, it will, the sediments will crust over the top and it will look a bit like a rock. That's not Australian, as you may have guessed, Yellowstone National Park. That's a massive mountain. That is very, very impressive. Um, so, where are we going with this? So, in Israel, so, now we're get, getting a bit closer to our Bible stories. Um, there's not much information around as to what the water sources were actually like during Bible times. So, I just took what I could about what the situation is now. Um, it may be slightly different, but probably not a lot. So Israel is a little bit the same as Australia. It's got a, a range of mountains and some big flat desert areas. So the same sort of thing happens. It's that we get the rain falling in the mountains, travelling down to groundwater storage areas. Um, the map on the left tries to indicate where the groundwater storage areas and the, and the water flow are. So, um, yeah, moving along because time is ticking. Oh, I just suppose. All right, so now we're talking about Moses and the rock. Just suppose that this was a mound spring. Right. Like I said before, this is speculation, but technically it's feasible. It may have happened this way. So what if the rock which Moses struck was an old mound spring? In so striking the rock, he broke the crust on the side of the rock, and that would expose the water below, and it would flow out under its own natural pressure. Because right. he's reduced that height of the mound spring so the water can flow out again. Still a miracle? Yes, it is. Because Moses wasn't a geologist or a hydrogeologist. He didn't have a degree in the University of Egypt. He didn't look around the area and say, oh, that's a mound spring. I reckon if I struck the side of that, I might get some water, you know. Um, no, of course he didn't. God told Moses which rock to strike. Right. We read in other Bible stories of where God uses natural phenomenon to serve his purpose. Um, just one example is Paul and Silas. They were freed from the prison by an earthquake. Right. So, perhaps it was a mound spring. So just looking at the miracle side of it, what about the next time Moses was meant to get water from the rock? He was only meant to speak to the rock. Speaking to the rock wouldn't have broken the crust on it. Now we know Moses was a bad boy and did the wrong thing, but nonetheless, the Lord expected water to come from that rock just by speaking to it. That's truly a miracle. 
Now that's the end of our first story about water from a rock. Uh, we'll just have a little <laughs> comical interlude here. No, it's not the end. Sorry. Okay, all right, settle down. So, there are perhaps some other explanations. When I was researching this presentation, I came across another story, um, true story, um, back in the 1930s. You can read through that if you want while I'm waffling along. Um, a, a major in an army um, actually cracked the side of a rock with a shovel and water came out. Um, so you know, apparently they started calling him Moses after that. Uh, um, so there's another example of the same sort of thing happening and something slightly different or similar, apparently porous rock can act like a sponge so the water sucks through the rock but then you've got channels through underneath the rock. Now that photo, it might be a little hard to see but there's actually streams of water flowing out halfway down the cliffside. Uh, we've actually got stuff like that happening in the Murray River, believe it or not but those streams of water are below the surface of the water and we actually get streams of salt water from the irrigated land and it's full of fertiliser and stuff that pours into the Murray River and that's why we have salt problems with the Murray River. Uh, that is the end of Moses and the Rock. Uh, so... About halfway, I'm doing all right. So let's move on to our second story. So we're looking at non-artesian groundwater now. Um, so in Australia, we're used to seeing windmills like this as we drive around the country. And these windmills pump water from underground into st stock troughs or tanks, and we use them for you know, cows and sheep and, uh, and ourselves. Uh, in more modern times, we tend to use electric pumps. Uh, for small bores, we often have a small pump just sitting on top of the bore inside of a little box, which we can see in the photo on the left. And in the diagram on the right, for big bores, we actually put a pump down the hole and the water flows out through a, what's called a pump column, a big hose, out to the surface. Some of these large bores they normally started around 15 centimetres in diameter. Some of the big ones are up to like 60 centimetres in diameter. So they're actually big enough to fall down. And they're hundreds and hundreds of metres deep. So you wouldn't want to fall down a 60 centimetre bore that's hundreds and hundreds of metres deep, because you ain't getting out. And it doesn't matter how long you can tread water for. So, in the Bible we read of people using wells to get their water. And this is our normal picture of a well, you know, the old wishing well style thing. Um, you know, if you're in you know, England where there's lots of rain and so on, you might see a well like there is on the left, or if you're in a, in a desert country, you might imagine a well like we see on the right there. Uh, I want to try and um, shed a bit more of realistic picture on wells in Israel. And the picture on the left is taken from above, looking down onto the well. So you're looking right down into the well. well as they call it, a well, is 46 metres deep. And they dug that during the 9th century. That's a big effort or a very long shovel. Um, the well at Jerusalem, 32 metres deep, right? And you actually sort of walk down into that one. Now, when you read in the Bible of a well, you don't think of that. You think of what we saw before, a, a little hole with a thing on top and a bucket and a rope. Um, not like that at all. 
So, here's a look at Isaac's wells. So, I'm not going to read all of this. Um, but I'll just paraphrase the story. So, Isaac was moving house, looking for a new suburb for his family to live in. Each time he found a new block of land, he dug a well for water. But the neighbours were a bit rough. They claimed the well for themselves and kicked him out. This happened a few times until he found a nice suburb down south. <laughs> Very good, got that. Okay, so let's stop and consider the words dig the well, all right? So I've sort of highlighted those in the scriptures there. Um, as we saw in the last slide, dig the well doesn't mean you just get the shovel out of the, you know, the back of the car, pick a spot and, and dig for half an hour and find water. You know? They didn't have a local kennards to go and hire a backhoe or a drill rig or whatever. They were dug by hand. So all these times that they shifted house, they dug a new well, you know, 40 odd metres deep by hand. That's incredible. Um, uh, Isaac eventually ended up at Beersheba and we read here that his servants digged a well. Yeah. Should have written there. His servant spent several years painstakingly, back-breakingly digging a hole in the ground. But anyway, they found water. Um, and it's uh, the name of the place is still called Beersheba. So that's Isaac's well at Beersheba. 70 metres deep. That is amazing. So, apart from a lot of hard work and mind-blowingly you know, difficult to do, um, you imagine some of this desert ground. I mean, you can see all the stones that they put around it. That's from the ground around it. You know, they didn't go and bring them in in a truck. So you had to dig through all that stony ground first before you got underneath. Um, so, is there more to the story than just Isaac moving around the countryside, digging a lot of holes in the ground? All right. Beersheba. A couple of years ago, we heard a lot about Beersheba. No. No. We step forward a few thousand years from Isaac and the descendants of Israel, being England and Australia in particular, they're fighting a war around Beersheba. And most of us know from the stories we heard a couple of years ago that... Um, you know, the, the major things around there. But the Allied forces used Beersheba as a staging point for their attack on Jerusalem, which was their final target. Why did they use Beersheba? Because it had water. They needed water for their army, for their horses. All right. What did they use? Isaac's well. Amazing. So the light horse, the Australian light horse, they attacked Beersheba in the now famous Charge of the Light Brigade to capture Beersheba because of its water. So did God engineer Isaac's adventure with the wells just so that Jerusalem could be returned to Israel after 1917? Quite probably he did. Yeah. Something to think about. So that's... Um, the end, for those who are asleep, but you don't know it's the end, do you? <laughs> if we leave the lights out, we can all get up really quietly and sneak out. <laughs> anyway, uh, if we could have the lights on, please. <laughs> so, um, we talked a lot about water tonight. So, water is fundamental to our natural existence, our physical existence as a human body thing. <clears throat> but the Bible also likens water to the Holy Spirit, which is fundamental to our spiritual existence. Right? So 